Excellent. Well, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Mene uh, Pangalos um, from AstraZeneca. So we're going to hear uh, some perspectives from industry. Um, and I think you'll see there, just up on the slide, there's uh, a range of things that we're going to hear about. So I'm looking forward to uh, industry perspectives. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. And I literally have a, a couple of slides. And, and I think one of the things that you'll see is that three of the themes that actually um, Robert talked about are similar on, on my slide as well. So hopefully I'll highlight some, some different examples. As a neuroscientist and as a scientist, I have to say I, I completely agree. I think we're a tipping point in terms of medical innovation. I think it's, ne it's never been a more exciting time to be either a science in academia or a science in industry. So a six, and actually picking six is actually quite challenging, but I'm going to pick six. And there's, there's other things we could talk about as well, and maybe we'll do it, talk about them in the Q&A. But the six areas that I've picked through, if I, if I go through them one by one, so immune system therapies or immunotherapies, these are therapies that start to target your own immune system to treat disease. And you'll hear from Andrew, we'll go into a lot more detail around some of the therapies that are being developed right now in oncology, uh, immune therapies in oncology, using agents such as um, PDL1 or OX40 or CTLA4. These are uh, immune system modulators that either activate your immune system or slow down your immune system to actually identify the cancer in your body, target it, and destroy it. And the types of responses we're getting in diseases like metastatic melanoma, which was basically a six month death sentence, we're starting to see cures. Not in every patient, subpopulations of patients, but the, the, the efficacy in those patients that do respond is absolutely astounding. We're starting to see that therapy now evolve into lung cancer, into renal cancer, gastric cancer. Very, very exciting. Has a potential to be transformative for patients, as well as to be combined with more standard or small molecule targeted agents and really change how we think about oncology. Perhaps even one day, talking about oncology and cancer the same way we talk about HIV today. Really transformational. And then you start to expand beyond oncology into areas like asthma, COPD, other autoimmune disorders, and perhaps we can start to harness the immune system in ways to tackle a wider breadth of diseases. Personalized healthcare, of course, comes into that as well. And again, we, 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 we heard talk of that and the, the dramatic decline in the cost and speed with which we can sequence genomes your DNA, you'll be able to go to your GP, I'm sure, in a few years' time, and you just go and you give a little blood sample or saliva sample, and you're going to get your DNA day sequence. At some stage in the future, it'll be done at birth, and you have a DNA chip that goes into your medical record, and you'll start to predict and project what diseases you might be at risk of getting and what lifestyle choices you have to make going forwards. But personalized healthcare is an incredibly powerful thing. If you can understand what it is about the 30% of people that respond to an immunotherapy in oncology and how you change that number from being 30% to 60%. It's incredibly powerful. We have collaborations now in oncology with groups like Cancer Research UK. We're, we're actually taking out all of our oncology therapies in lung cancer, and when a patient comes in, their, their genome or their tumor is sequenced. And from that sequencing, the physician then determines which is the best molecule to treat that patient with depending on the pathway that's activated and the, the resistance mechanisms that we think are in play. And to give you an example, we have a, we have a, a molecule that, um, that's called AZD9291. This is a, a, a drug that targets metastatic lung cancer with a very specific activating mutation in the, in, in the lungs of those cancer patients. So the drug has been specifically engineered to target just that patient population. And that that population and that drug arises predominantly, or that, that mutation arises predominantly through resistance of the tumors as you go through cycles of treatment. So when a patient who has lung cancer is on a traditional drug like Eressa and they develop resistance and their disease starts progressing, their tumor is unsequenced, you identify whether they have the appropriate mutation. If they do, they go on to 9291. And the benefit of that is potentially another 12 to 24 months of life. And then the tumor develops resistance again, and you identify what the activating mutation is again in that tumor. And then you give them another drug. And in this way, you can start to think about how you make 
cancer, a chronic illness, or an illness where you're not going to the, your physician and saying you have three months to live, but you start to think about how it's a disease that you can manage. You tie that up then to the immuno-oncology therapies, and I think it's potentially transformational. But personalized health care is now hitting the tarmac or the road, the rubber sitting on the road, not just in oncology. Oncology, I think, is what has, has led the space uh, and the field, but we're seeing personalized health care now in asthma, in COPD. We're thinking about patients that have certain types of immune responses, certain types of infiltrating cells in their lungs that we think make them more susceptible or more sensitive to one particular treatment versus another. So you're going to start to see personalized medicine being impactful in COPD, in asthma, in lupus, in RA. It's, it's really going to, in cardiovascular disease, it's, it's really going to become, I think, absolutely pivotal in everything we do. And of course, it has huge impact, because what it means is that the risk-benefit for patients, if you think about how we used to treat patients with small molecule drugs, Half of them would respond maybe and half of them wouldn't. And we really didn't have a good handle on who the responsive population was and who the unresponsive population was. What does that do? It makes your drug trials much larger, much more expensive. It makes your health care costs much larger and more expensive because half of your patients aren't responding. So when you can start to tailor therapies to specific individuals, you understand your disease well enough, that you can tailor a therapy to that patient it means the clinical development becomes more efficient, time of getting a drug to market becomes more efficient, ultimately healthcare costs come down, and most importantly, patients benefit the most. Very, very impactful. Human cell technology, again, Robert touched on this. Let me expand on it. He showed Doug Melton's work on, on, on generating pancreas from stem cells. We work with Doug actually in, in, in this space. But you can do this now with heart cells. You can generate cardiomyocytes and start to think about how you can regenerate heart in a heart failure patient. You can start to think about how you generate podocytes in for, for kidney disease. We start to use these not just as therapeutics, but also as models in our research labs, models that become much more predictive and more useful than doing experiments in rodents. You start to use these, these models in our safety labs, where we think about is the drug going to have an adverse event on the gut. So for example, we use stem cells to generate small models, complex models, three-dimensional, of the gut in your GI tract to understand whether a drug is likely to have GI toxicity. We use it to develop complex models of the heart in vitro so we can start to understand what the risks are of cardiac toxicity. Huge implication, again, which has a, 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 the potential of impacting not just patients but also our efficiency and our ability to predict safety issues, efficacy issues, etc. as we move programs through, through the research labs. Oligonucleotide therapy is again something that I'm, I'm very excited to see progressing. People have been working on antisense therapies, therapies that basically target DNA and messenger RNA in the cells of patients, but they've been doing it for the past almost 20 years without much success. But today, these therapeutics are starting to show activity in patients, again in cancer and a number of different indications. We've started to understand how to modify oligonucleotides in a way that makes them more stable, more drug-like, which then enables them to become therapeutics. And we have a number of different partnerships with companies like ISIS, uh, where we work on antisense RNA, antisense oligonucleotides to try and block the expression of certain genes. We work with a company called Regulus, targeting microRNA, which tries to modulate the activity of different genetic pathways. And then finally, we have a collaboration with a company called Moderna, which is trying to um, use modified RNA to actually express proteins intracellularly to start to give novel therapeutic approaches again to treat a number of different diseases. Gene editing, an acronym for a technology called CRISPR, is today transforming how we do research. When we used to make preclinical animal models, transgenic animals expressing a certain gene in a mouse or an unhuman primate or knockout, um, animals, again, in, in, generally in rodents, it used to take years to do this work, or if we wanted to make a genetically modified cell line. With this new CRISPR technology, which evolved actually from fundamental basic research, understanding how bacteria defend them, themselves from pathogens that infect bacteria, bacteriophage, that basic biology led to the technology of CRISPR, which now enables you to genetically modify cells in days, weeks, and months. So you can make animals in weeks and months, you can make cell lines in weeks and months at a scale that we could never do before 
which then starts to enables you to actually identify new pathways, new genes that are important for, uh, for, for, for solving uh, difficult and complex biological problems. Finally, intelligent medicines. Again, we talked about data explosion. How many, 70% of the world's population today have mobile phones across the world. About 40% have smartphones. So think about pills that have small nanosensors on them that can tell you whether the pill is having a desired effect on your blood glucose, your lipid levels, your blood pressure, your heart rate, that's connected to your smartphone. So your doctor and, your set and you will know whether you need to take an increased dose, whether the medicine is working. That sort of technology, again, is starting to evolve, is starting to go into medicines today, and I think will be uh, you know, in, in, in our shop windows in, in the not-too-distant future, and again, has the ability to transform how we think about treating ourselves, friends, family, and ultimately, I think all of this will have a hugely transformational uh, effect on, on patient welfare, patient well-being. Finally, and very quickly, again, just to talk about the UK, this is all achievable in the UK. Again, we saw the, 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 the slide around how competitive the UK is. In terms of scientific, basic scientific research, publications, impact, the UK competes with the very best places around the world, in particular Boston and San Francisco. There's a reason why we're investing $500 million to move one of our major research headquarters to Cambridge. It's because it helps us access the research community in London, Cambridge, Oxford, which can compete with the very, very best institutions around the world. By doing that, I think we can keep the UK at the forefront of scientific research and attract a lot of inward investment to the UK that has, again, the position to really drive economic growth and ultimately patient welfare. Thanks very much.